This is Wildcat Dojo Conversations. Hey, welcome to another show. I'm Sensei Michelle, your host, and this is Wildcat Dojo Conversations. I'm here with Sensei Jackie. Hi. And Landon. Hi, everybody. And we are going to talk about swords. I just want to say this subject is broad. R R R. Such broad swords. That's an understatement. (laughs) So it is definitely not going to fit into all one podcast. But we're just going to see what kind of mischief we can get into today. This seems like a ridiculous statement, but it was brought up over and over again in the research. So I'm going to say it out loud. Swords cut and stab. Mm, That's what they do. (laughs) Like I wrote right in this. It seems like a stupid statement, but since they kept on saying it in the research, I feel like that's what I should say in order to start this out. Must have some meaning. I got the idea to do this podcast because I watched a show once on the show called Unsolved Mysteries about a Japanese blade called the Masamuni blade. And it's lost. No one knows where it is. And so we're going to tell you the whole story of that, but not today. Ooh, already a teaser. I thought that you were going to say, we're going to start the investigation to find it. (laughs) Because that's our job. (laughs) It would be like sword mysteries uncovered. (laughs) We are all looking forward to that one. Oh, yes, for sure. Anyway, the name of that blade, Masamuni, that's the maker. Oh, really? Yes. Hanjo Masamuni. And in the show and online, I've heard it with this accent on two different blades. because So it could be Masamuni, the way I'm saying it, or Masanami. Oh. Yes, and I don't know which one is correct. So if you do, please tell us. We would like to know. Everywhere I looked, it's spelled M-A-S-A-M-U-N-E. All right. Because all this cutting information uh. is so old, I thought we would start with the first sword ever found. Where and when was that, Sensei Jackie? Wikipedia, our best friend, answered that question. In 3300 BCE, which I am reminding you that BCE is the replacement now for BC, and it means before the Common Era. Anyway, the sword was found in Turkey in a city called Arsiantepe. I hope I'm saying that right. Boy, that was really well said, right, Landon? We're a little jealous. I'm impressed. Me too. And the sword was made from bronze, but the bronze contained arsenic. They called it arsenical bronze. I myself have never heard of that, but maybe some of our listeners have. And and if you have, please tell us about it, because is the arsenic in that bronze poisonous? And would it poison the person who owned the sword? Like really? just from holding it? Or do you, would it poison you if you stabbed, stabbed and then it, yeah. it, the arsenic got in your blood? Like, hey. is that a whole nother killing method within that sort? And did they even know it was poison back in the day? Or was it not poison? It was just a mineral that was used in uh, strengthening the blade of the sword. We don't know. We don't know this. That's a cool question. But Quora, another site that I use quite often, agrees with the time frame. But it says that ancient Egyptians invented the sword during the Bronze Age. Both sites say the sword quickly came to symbolize strength, power, liberty, and military honor which seems to continue to this day. That was cool. Yes. And before we go too far, I do want to reiterate the name of the site that we used, which is called knightsedge.com. Do you guys know any other sites that you were using a lot? Well, I used americanswords.com, armstoarmor.com, historynet.com, and Encyclopedia Britannica. Very nice. That's a lot of sources, Landon. I'm telling you. And Quora seems to come up in a lot of the things that I have researched. And I'm not quite sure why that one is there all the time. Okay, back on history. Now that we know where the first one, therefore the oldest one so far, was found, let's round robin some history like we always do. People call swords the queen of the weapons because it is beautiful, deadly, and because it took special skill and know-how to build it and serious skill and practice to use it. Uh huh. <laughs> Beautiful and deadly in one sentence. Yeah, it's I, quite weird. In the chess board or in the chess game, isn't the queen the deadliest? She's the most powerful. Of course. That's so they're cool. right. It's the queen. It's the queen. Well, another way to classify swords, though, and I like this, is geographical because Oriental and Asian swords were classified together. 
Then there's European and also African. And a side note, according to Knight's Edge, lots of the Asian and Oriental swords found their origins in Egyptian swords, which is in Africa. So why don't we just classify them all as swords? <laughs> Equality being Jackie's big thing. <laughs> That's it. I do want to say that I found this really a fun hole to drop into because that section of the of Egypt where the Nile is, that beautiful heartland, yes, is where a lot of civilization pros and cons were born, and this was one of them. But anyway, Landon, weren't you looking at some of those Egyptian blades? Yes, I specifically looked at the scimitar. And the scimitar is so cool. You're missing out if you don't go and look at the scimitar. How pristine it is for that time. And ornamental a little bit. So cool. So I definitely recommend going to check that out. Okay, I'll jump in with a weird one. According to Knight's Edge, metal swords didn't really come into play in America or in Australia. And in South and Central America, they used a wooden sword called a makana. The Aztecs supposedly stuck glass called obsidian into their wooden swords to make them horrifically, dangerously cutting. Oh, wow. yes. Exactly. Yuck. Ugh. Okay, Landon, I think you're up. I found some great information about American swords. Should I tell them? Please do it. So, and If you want to keep it a secret from them, just tell us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell anyone else. <laughs> okay, here we go. Swords were made in North America from approximately 1750 to the present day. Mostly, they're government issued. They have changed shape and use with each generation, from the helmet pummel of the 1830s to the bayonets of World War I. I found a few private companies that made blades, but mostly knives. Also, the rarest American swords have sold for $5.5 million dollars. Wow. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Two pieces of trivia. On this first one was the most expensive one ever sold, $7.7 million, not American. Oh. I don't know what country. My brain feels like it's Egyptian, but I could be wrong on that because I didn't write that down on our fact sheet. And speaking of American-made blades, my sister lived in Hawaii for a while, and she sent me, and we're going to put this out as a tweet one day soon, right, Landon? That's okay, she sent sure. me a replica of an authentic Hawaiian weapon. So it's the shape and size of a ping pong paddle. Yes. Us, definitely. And just like a ping pong paddle, it has two sides. But unlike a ping pong, pong, ping pong paddle. Wow, I didn't know that was a 3 peer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> unlike a ping pong paddle, it's not padded. <laughs> another P word. Like- it's just flat wood. And so it's really good for slapping people. But all around the edge of that rounded part of the paddle are shark's teeth. Mm. And it it has a name. I'm not going to try to say the name because I'll get it wrong. The first word is H-O-E. But when I researched it, all I had to do was write in ancient Hawaiian weapons came up within the first three pictures. Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. So if you don't want to wait for our picture on Twitter, you can go that way. And the first time I saw that weapon from a distance, I thought it was a hairbrush. And then when I got close, I realized it was so not a hairbrush. The shark's teeth part is so sharp. Like I was looking at it yesterday and I was touching it against my hand and I was going, yikes. You know, having that rake down any part of your body or go into any part of your body. Ooh, it is a close up weapon, though. It's not a sword. It would be more the size of a knife. Also makes you not want to get bit by a shark. Like, like somebody was sitting around saying, gee, I hope I get a shark bite soon. Oh, come yeah. on, shark, <laughs> bite me, bite me. All, right. All right, back on to back it, Back right? on. Another way to classify swords is by their look. And it's from pretty common looking, recognizable, to rare, odd, and even to the weird. Okay, I'm going to start us out. There's a straight blade with both of the edges sharp, like a knight used to use. Wow. And then you go right into the curved blade with only one edge sharp. That blade is said to have started in Egypt, but is definitely made famous by the Japanese swords. A few sites I went to said Japanese swords are the most famous swords in the world. Really? And that site also told me that a blade that has only one sharp edge really should be called a saber. Mm, Okay. And that a sword should only be used by a blade that has two edges. I'm pretty sure they're probably right, but, you know, for all intent and purposes, let's just have some fun and call everything swords and get over ourselves, shall we? 
sensei. I'd like to. There's another one that is a, a single-edged sword, but the end of it is a uh, spudded or rounded looking. Oh. oh, I don't think that one's as common as pointy at the end. Do you? No, no. I don't at all. And there are swords that are still curved, but with an expanding blade, and that's a scimitar. Okay, now when you get into the curved blade, you have some blades that are curved on the inside or the concave edge. Ooh. I know. That seems really um, odd to me. But can't you see, like if you're holding it in your hand in that inside edge, can't you see kind of using it kind of like a sickle? A oh. sickle, uh, yes, yes. Right? Yeah, definitely. I have a pocket knife that works that way because I don't carry it with me all the time. That's not my everyday knife. And every time I pick up this knife, I start to cut and realize I'm using the wrong side. Every single time. It's Why hilarious. Is it not and that, that's what I say. Why is it not cutting? Why is it acting like that? Well, on the Knight's Edge site, the last category was individual types of swords, uh, like an executioner's sword, and one called a flamberge. Now, I can say that it's a rapier, but some people like to call it a rapier, with a flexible blade to aid in pairing and more. And pairing is like, you know, going clash, 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 in case you're not familiar with it. Did I ever tell you, Landon, that I once took a fencing class with my mother? Really? So much fun. We had such a great time. And she got a better grade than I did. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Can I just add that Sensei Jackie's the queen of pronunciation? Oh, isn't she? Thank God she's the here. queen. Well, thanks to those who love the lexicon, Sensei Jackie also loves it. We. Oui. Okay, like we're ever going to stay on track here. When I was playing with this research, by now, my brain was exhausted. And frankly, it's exhausted right this minute. <laughs> We can relate. But I say we push. What do you say? I say let's cut through all of the other things and go. I agree. So another way to categorize swords is by whether they were held with one hand or with two. Now, all these really long swords that were held with two were approximately six feet long, but I did not write down the footage. So if I'm a little off on one of them, hey, please get in touch and tell me because then we'll put it out as a correction. The three that they mentioned in the article that I read was the European longsword, six right. feet long, the Scottish Great Claymore. Frankly, I feel like they said that one was longer than six feet, but doesn't that sound like the Scots? They were crazy. They, they're self-proclaimedly crazy. I don't think that's an insult. I don't think so. You could use it to get social distancing. <laughs> and more ways than one. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then that first long sword from the Japanese, the Odachi. Ah, those all had to be held with two hands. They were so long. I think this is a good time to remind them to check our Twitter page soon, Landon, so that they can see some pictures of some different types of swords, including the Hawaiian weapon and, and then some other stuff. Maybe we'll put up that scimitar. Us, for sure. You can visit our Twitter page at Wildcat Dojo. And frankly, we're everywhere on the web at Wildcat Dojo. If you want to search us on YouTube, Facebook, or our webpage, we're all Wildcat Dojo. Now, we'll give you our telephone number and our email a little bit later on in the show. All righty. I don't know that they need us to do this, Landon, but as we're going to be talking about swords in another episode, would you please tell them just the basic parts of the sword? If you Google this, they can get into some serious details. You got it, Sensei. The sword is made up of the blade, the handle, also known as the hilt, and the guard piece between the blade and the handle. Later, the pommel, a cap on the hilt, became prominent and even ornate, as did the handles. That is a very basic makeup of the parts, but it will give you a visual. Also, some swords are made with one piece from the tip of the blade to the tip of the handle, while others are welded where the handle meets the blade. On the Knight's Edge site, that process, that welding is called a rat tail. Which, ew. Ew. <laughs> ew. But you can see what they mean. They put the two pieces together and they hold them with a weld as opposed to making it all one piece. The traditional katanas, by far and away, are all one piece, one piece. right? Yes. From this point forward, we're really not going to stop and discuss time or shapes. Everything's going to interchange. Like most of history, people were advancing in different places around the globe without knowing that somewhere else, someone else was making the same strides. Okay, so pick it up for me. I will. Starting in the ninth century, the Middle Ages, blades became thinner and narrower. Hilts, the handles became more ornate, and the popular one was called the arming sword. And in the medieval times, approximately the 16th century, in Europe, 
there were two main blade shapes, straight and leaf. Greek zephos is an example. Leaf is interesting, pointy, then wider, then a little narrower near the hilt. That is interesting. So that was in the 16th century. They got skinny up by the hilt and skinny down at the point, and then they were a little wider right. in the middle. That make that would make stabbing, <laughs> right? Oh, yes. It's like uh, a pilot hole for your stab. Oh, man. Do you guys think that it goes without saying that the guard between the blade and the handle has changed over time? I certainly think so, because remember in our ninja podcast, how the ninjas used their atsuba to stand on, to get up on the wall, and then they pulled up the rest of the sword with the uh, cord. That's right. They used it as a step. Well, I'm going to mention this because I'm not sure if people take it for granted or not. I never really thought about it until I did this research. The original shape of a sword was in the sign of a plus sign, an addition sign, a cross, and it was called a cruciform shape. More modern blades have lighter guards in between the cutting edge and the handle. And they do go by many names. As Sensei Jackie just mentioned, the Japanese word is tsuba, T-S-U-B-A. But guard will certainly work. Yes. And some of them are round. Some of them are square. They come in all different kinds of shapes. They come in all different kinds of ornamentation. Hmm. Some are just exquisitely beautiful. But they're always attached really tightly between the handle and the cutting edge. All right. What's up? Did you know that on the Knight's Edge site, they say that there was only one straight double-edged sword used in Japan, and it was called the Sergi. They add that the same word is used to describe a Chinese straight broadsword. Who knew? So I think what happened was because in really ancient times, Japan and China were kind of like, get, they got along with each other. And, and a yes. lot of that Chinese tradition moved over to Japan. And that first broadsword from China was adopted in Japan. Ah, And that's how that first sword started. And then, well, we'll tell them in the next podcast, that's when everything started to change when they wanted to improve the blade. But here's a teaser. Did you know that the curve of the blade is made from the heat and clay? Really? And clay. Oh, I, I know. But I did not know clay. I know. Okay, finish us up with whatever it is we're talking about here, Sensei Jackie. Let's finish this part up with the, the rapier or rapier also known as the epée, spade, or espada, the Zorro sword. Okay, wait. you got to stop and love all the different Zorros. My favorite, Antonio Banderas. Puss and boots. <laughs> right. I never knew the Shrek character was based on Zorro. And I want to know which one did he do first? Did he do the Puss and Boots character before he made the Zorro movie? We're going to have to look that up. I doubt it. You but think he did that first? And sure, because I think that the Shrek movie made everybody laugh because they knew him from being oh. the swashbuckling Zor Zorro. Okay. Anyway, this blade is made for fencing. It's quick, light, sharp on both sides, and pointed on guard. <laughs> Popular in the 16th and 17th century all throughout Europe. Finally, we're getting really, really close to the Japanese katana. Yay! Oh, yes. Generally speaking which is always a dangerous thing to do. Yes. Curved blades are associated with Eastern culture and the cruciform shape is associated with the European culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more facts for us here? Sensei, I do have one more scimitar fact. Some experts say the scimitar was the curved blade precursor to the Japanese katana. Hmm. And it was first used in Central Asia by, guess who, the Turkish warriors. Ah. 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 Well, we found fact. the first sword. That's a cool fact. Okay, that does take us to our next episode, which is going to be on the Eastern Blade. We'll specifically pick up with the Japanese katana. And from there, we'll move on to the Masamuni sword. Meanwhile, here is a, a really major teaser on the Masamuni sword, which I just couldn't believe when I found it out. You guys know how when you type a question into Google, it gives you alternate questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So when I was searching the first sword ever found, that's what I typed in, the oldest sword ever found. And here are some of the other questions that came up. What is the best sword? What is the deadliest sword? What is the rarest sword? And what is the strongest sword? And the answer to all four of those questions was the Masamuni blade. The same answer? Wow. That is cool, right? Uh -huh. That's 
pretty cool. The only question that wasn't answered by that was what was the most expensive sword? And that was that $7.7 million one that I didn't write it down where it was from. So I'm telling them, stay tuned because there is some excitement around the corner, right? Oh, yeah. We, we have enjoyed today's show, have we not? Yes, we have. That was fun. And what we would like to ask you to do, and we ask you just a few episodes back is, tell somebody about our podcast. Write a friend. Hey, when you're driving in the car with a friend, put us on and say, <laughs> listen to this, right? That's put a us good on idea. The, the radio, although <laughs> I, don't, I, I put quotes around that because what do you call it these days? The Entertainment Center. What about if they, can they attach our tweet to their tweet? Oh, oh yeah, that yeah. would be cool. Can you retweet us? Retweet, retweet. That would be awesome. Thanks, guys. And maybe even mention us in your Facebook. Oh, yeah, for sure. So any of those things, we would so much appreciate this. Let's not say we would. Meanwhile, we did not give them the phone number and the email, so let's shoot that out real quick. If you want to leave us a voicemail or a text, you do it at 954-350-1915. And the email is dojoconversations at aol.com. And let's mention Honor Athletics before we go home. Honor Athletics is our sponsor. They sell martial arts equipment and other stuff, hand weights, some apparel, some different kinds of t-shirts and shorts and stuff. Some boxing uh, equipment. MMA stuff in Georgia. And they work online and they are honorathletics.com. Hi, Cynthia. And they are also at 770-945-5150. And you really get personal service when you call Cynthia direct, right? Absolutely. We love that about her. And don't forget to mention Wildcat Dojo for your 10% discount. With that, we're going to say goodnight. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Hope you enjoyed it. Oh, me too. See you guys next week. Thanks for being here. Hope you join us again next week on Wildcat Dojo Conversations.